So welcome everybody. Um, Jennifer, now are we saying Cavarini? I answer to anything that's even remotely close. <laughs> if I'm being interviewed or if I'm doing any kind of talk, whatever I'm introduced as, that is the official pronunciation for the rest of the day. I'm hearing okay. some, I'm still hearing that soft CH, but I heard you say the hard CH. So we would like to know yeah. what you like the best. Well, I, you know, it's my married name. I'm a Neidenbach. Oh, that's and, what you want to be. <laughs> so, and no one could ever pronounce Neidenbach or spell Neidenbach. And so I was determined no matter what, I was going to change my name when I got married. And then of course, I fall in love with the guy with C-H-I-A-V-E-R-I-N-I. -I -I. Couldn't have just been, you know, Smith or something. <laughs> the Americanized pronunciation is Cheverini. But, you know, it's the Italian pronunciation is Chiaverini, you know, like Chianti, you know, or, and you know, that kind. So when we, we went on a trip to Italy and everybody there told us we were saying our name wrong. So we might, some of us, some of us have said, okay, well, we want to pronounce it correctly. I like pronouncing words correctly. My eldest son who studies Italian in college, he wants to study it, say it correctly as the Italians do, but lots of other people say Cheverini. So I will answer to anything even remotely close. <laughs> as long as I know people are trying, I just, you know, why be, you know, just give everybody a pass. I'm good. So we will say welcome Jennifer Cheverini is um, <laughs> readings from kind of Milwaukee. She, Jennifer is a New York Times bestselling author of several historical novels, including Resistance Women and Enchantress of Numbers and Mrs. Lincoln's Sisters, which just came out in paperback, as well as the much loved Elm Creek series. She is a graduate from the University of Notre Dame and the University of Chicago. She is an avid history lover and researcher which we can, I think is pretty evident by the books that you write. Um, she lives in Madison with her husband and two sons. And here we are today to talk about your new novel, The Women's March. So do you wanna start by giving us just a little bit of an elevator pitch about the book? Well, sure, this, uh, the novel is, as you can tell from the subtitle, it's um, a novel about the, um, 1913 woman suffrage procession that took place on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. the day before President-elect Woodrow Wilson's um, inauguration. And one of the, well, the, the primary organizer of the event was the well-known and even today well-remembered suffragist Alice Paul. And she chose this day for this, this suffrage march, which at the time was the largest uh, political demonstration in US history. She picked this day to, in, with very specific reasons in mind. She wanted to, well, first of all, the day before the inauguration in Washington, DC, she knew the crowds would be in town and all the media would be there ready to report on all of the inauguration activities the next day. So she wanted to take advantage of the crowds and of the great timing to, to stage this suffrage march. And she also wanted to make sure that she sent a, a, a very clear message to the incoming president that although he was a little vague and a little evasive on the campaign trail, while he was running for office about where he really stood on the issue of woman suffrage. She wanted to put him on notice that he would have to make it an important priority during his administration. Whether he liked it or not, he was going to have to deal with suffrage and with suffragists because they were going to be there ready to challenge him as, um, and, and he wouldn't be able to just get away with kind of avoiding the question anymore. Well, do you want to read a little piece of it to give us a flavor of the writing? That would be great. Sure. Well, in this novel, I have three narrators. The first one of them, of course, is Alice Paul, who, as the leader of the congressional committee, who was in charge of the procession. And I should add, too, another goal of the procession was to bring new awareness to a revitalized movement to focus on getting a national constitutional amendment 
to grant all women throughout the United States the right to vote rather than just doing it by a state by state measure, which was just too long and tedious and unlikely to succeed for everyone. So we have Alice Paul, who is in charge of the Congressional Committee. And then I have Ida B. Wells Barnett as another narrator. And she was a prominent black uh, journalist and uh, activist, suffragist as well, of course. And she was very well known internationally for her active and um, very um, vocal um, campaign against lynching. And then we have a third narrator and her name was Maud Malone. And Maud was really more of a representative of the working class. She was, as one critic in the newspaper called her, a militant suffragist librarian, which as soon as I read that, I thought, well, I don't know who you are, but I like you already. And she really was, whereas Ida B. Wells Barnett was advocating for the black community who needed the vote just to save their very lives, to get rid of Jim Crow policies and to um, increase the potential for uh, the, wel the welfare and the prosperity of the black community. And then Alice Paul wanted it so that she could have equality with, other, with male citizens. Maud Malone was re really very interested in the issues that affected the poor, that affected the working class. And so that's why she was so strongly drawn to this movement. And one of the things that Maud was known for, um, notorious for in fact, was that while political candidates of any political party, she was not fussy, she was not just campaigning for or against anyone, any political candidate, whenever they would make a speech, if she could get there, she would challenge them during their talk just and ask them to just say where they stood on suffrage. She just wanted them to make their positions known. And you'd think that everybody else attending the meeting would want to know the answer to that question too, right? You know, she wasn't trying to tell him, tell any of these candidates which way to vote. She just wanted them to state their positions, which voters have a right to know. And Although Maud couldn't vote, she thought she had a right to know too. So one of the one of the reasons that I wanted to include Maud in this book was because of her just the way she enjoyed just challenging these men when they were campaigning, just to get them to own up to where they stood on the issue. So I'm going to read you something from the prologue where we first meet Maud where she is doing one of her favorite things. She's standing up and she just wants to ask Woodrow, candidate Woodrow Wilson how he feels. So at this point in the story, uh, candidate Wilson is really on a roll. He is really getting to the swing of things. He's talking about um, the, the need to keep business in line and to avoid monopolies for the prosperity of all and then all of a sudden, what about votes for women? Someone interrupted from the balcony. It was a woman's voice, full and musical, with an Irish lilt. Wilson abruptly fell silent as heads craned and murmurs arose, a whisper, a whip ripple of confusion and annoyance and disgust. Stepping out from behind the podium and approaching the front of the stage, Wilson scanned the upper seats until his gaze fell upon a fair, auburn haired woman dressed in a purple shirtwaist and a hat adorned with a yellow feather. She awaited his response, her gaze fixed on his, determined and utterly devoid of deference. And yet there is something warm and appealing in her expression too. Slender and apparently in her mid thirties, she would probably be quite pretty if she smiled. What is it, madam? He called up to her over the grumbles of the crowd. You say you want to destroy monopolies, her eyebrows rose, signifying the innocence and eminent rationality of her query. I ask you, what about woman suffrage? Men have a monopoly on the vote. Why not start there? The audience snickered. Sit down, someone groused loudly from the back. Woman suffrage, madam, is not a question for the federal government, Wilson explained patiently, clasping his hands behind his back. He felt almost as if he were at back at Bryn Mawr 
addressing a class of lovely but tragically uncomprehending female pupils. It is a matter for the states. As a representative of the National Party, I cannot speak to the issue. But I address you as an American, Mr. Wilson, the woman persisted, since you see to govern all of these United States, surely you can tell us where you stand. The crowd's growing dissatisfaction manifested in mutters and glares, in impatient shifting in seats. Let us not be rude to any woman, Wilson reminded them, silently adding, no matter how unwomanly she may be. To the offender herself, he replied firmly, I hope you will not consider it a discourtesy if I decline to answer these questions on this occasion. But I do consider it discourteous, Governor, and worse. She put her head to one side, curious. Unless you mean to say you have no opinion whatsoever? Throw her out, a deep voice bellowed just beyond the footlights, cutting off Wilson's reply. A few rows behind that fellow, another man rose from his seat, cupped his hands around his mouth, and shouted toward the balcony, why don't you go to your own meeting, girly? A roar of laughter followed. Go home and mind the babies. Put her out, where are the police? Wilson could have answered that. From his ideal vantage point, he easily spotted three grim-faced, gray-uniformed officers working their way down the aisles of the crowded balcony toward the woman. With them was a man in a well-cut dark suit, perhaps in his 50s, with dramatic features and an imperious manner, as if he were accustomed to having his orders obeyed. He said something to the woman and made a cutting gesture with his forearm. She threw him a retort over her shoulder. Then her gaze returned to Wilson's and held it, despite the jostling of the increasingly disgruntled men surrounding her. This could get ugly, Wilson realized. It would play very badly in the press. Now, gentlemen, let us remain civil, he urged, concealing his own rising annoyance. Why would she not simply sit down? I'm sure the lady will not persist when I positively decline to discuss the question now. He gestured for her to take her seat, and yet still she stood waiting for him to satisfy her question as if he had not made it perfectly clear that no answer would be forthcoming. Just then the policeman reached her. To Wilson's consternation, they seized her by the arms and waist, lifted her roughly and wrestled her from the hall through a fire exit against a backdrop of jeers, hisses and blistering insults. So Wilson has to try to grab hold of his composure and continue his speech and uh, meanwhile, Maud Malone is out on the fire escape, um, meeting you know several police officers and a, and one of their leaders to prevent her from doing the terrible thing of asking whether he was for or against suffrage. Terrible, terrible crime. So, <laughs> but what idea that you could have a second career doing chapter a day? It's actually oh, that would be fun. <laughs> you're such a good reader. And well, thank I'm you. Really not everybody can get the kind of enthusiasm and intonation and you know, it's just, I really oh, enjoy it's it. fun. You know, it comes from, I think, reading to my kids ever since they were just tiny little babies, you know? Uh, that, that's something that we always love to do. And not just when they were babies and little kids either, all the way through high school, uh, when they were home on summer vacation, uh, we would do something that we called lunch and legends. And every day when we would have lunch, you know, when I'd, I'd make the boys lunch or we'd all make our lunch together, um, I would have a book and usually it had something to do with maybe a family vacation we were planning to take. And we would read if we were planning to go to Iceland or Norway or, you know, somewhere in the American Southwest or Yellowstone, we would always find a book about folk tales or legends or myths from that area. And hence the name Lunch and Legends. And then every day, I would read aloud to them, um, you know, to kind of give them a sense of uh, some of the stories and folk tales from where we were going. And then it, it, once we ran out of legends, then we started doing classics. I read uh, Animal Farm and uh, The Once and Future King and all just all kinds of wonderful things. And my, my son, Nick, actually, he's 21 now, but he said that was always his favorite part of summer, which was really fun. But I think it probably comes from practice reading to my boys. And Where were you during the COVID? We could have done this lunch and legends virtually. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what a missed opportunity. Yeah. Well, 
for the next one. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> for this winter. <laughs> for the winter. Yes. Winter lunch and lunches. Well, let me know because I've okay. got books about. <laughs> right. Lisa, ask our ask our our favorite first question. Oh, so what was the spark or the origin of this particular story um, that pulled you in? Yeah. Well, I've always wanted to write a book about the suffrage movement in the United States because, you know, it's something that just fascinates me. And the whole idea that you could be denied the vote just because you're a woman is just, of course, it's very plausible, you know, because I know it happened and sexism no longer surprises me, but it, it's really infuriating. And uh, even looking back all those years, you know, I've, I've been able to vote, you know, since I turned 18, which is, you know, but just knowing that, you know, my grandmother and great grandmother and all those other generations of women just couldn't do, couldn't ch help choose the people who were representing them in government. Um, it always just kind of made me angry, but it's such a vast topic. Even if you narrow it down just to the United States, the suffrage movement covers generations and there are countless thousands of women and men. There were numerous men who participated in the suffrage movement as well. I, I didn't really know what my take on it would be. I knew that, of course, I could not cover the entire suffrage movement in one book. So how to get at it, how to have my own take on the subject, I couldn't quite, could, didn't quite have. That was what was preventing me from jumping in to that topic. But I had a lot of other books to write too. So I wasn't sitting around idle. I was just letting the idea kind of kindle in, you know, in the background. So then the idea for the Women's March came to me in January 2017, soon after the Women's March on Washington, the day after the inauguration of the 45th president. Now you might notice a little bit different from Alice Paul. Alice Paul did it the day before the March on, uh, March on Washington 2017 happened the day after. And it wasn't just in Washington either. There were satellite marches throughout the United States and even around the world. And here in my hometown of Madison, we had an estimated 100,000 people marching on State Street from, from Library Mall all the way to Capitol Square. So while I was following news coverage of those marches, I came across an article from Smithsonian Magazine. And they do wonderful long form feature articles on various aspects of American culture and American history. And they, they mentioned the, the, ongo the marches of our, of our day of January, 2017. And then they said, did you know that there is actually an important historical precedent to these demonstrations. And, you know, you had me at historical precedent. So <laughs> I, when I read it and I learned about Alice Paul's March and how important it was and why she chose the day she did and why it was like almost, it wasn't only to win sympathy and attention for the woman's suffrage movement, but it was to really announce this revitalized campaign to get that constitutional amendment and also to serve you know, a little bit of warning to Woodrow Wilson that they were not going to be ignored. I was just fascinated and I wanted to focus on the women's suffrage issue, the women's suffrage topic by zeroing in on this one important event and choosing three narrators that all kind of represented a different aspect of the event and they were all very much separated until the day of the march. And that was done deliberately because so many women, not only for this march, but throughout the history of suffrage, weren't all working as one unified group. They were working here and they were working there and they were working in this group on this part of the country. And it seemed like the Women's March just really brought all of these different groups and factions even together. Um, and so that's that I, when I, you know, and then I found my three narrators and I wanted to talk about how they were all involved in this different um, subject. And, um, and then the book just grew out of, out of the desires to satisfy my own curiosity about, about these women and then the march itself and all that followed. I'm fascinated with, cause we've heard you talk about we both heard you talk about lots of different historical subjects and um, 
I remember with resistance women, it was important for you to connect the characters together. Right. But, right. And in this case, they're thema of course they're very thematically connected, but it was okay for you to have them separate. It almost right. made the point. And did you have to struggle with that? And also, it sounds like Alice Paul was like a, a no-brainer. Like she was right. always right. gonna be your person, even though there were a couple other people at the... Right, right, like Lucy Burns, her closest comrade, you know, who was her second in command of the Congressional Committee. Yeah, I think it would have been, because Alice was the, you know, the impetus behind the entire march. She was the one who organized it, she conceived it. Um, I, I think the book would have been incomplete without her perspective. But it was also very important to me to deal with intersectionality between you know, all of the issues of race and class and privilege and you know, the outsider perspective. So I wanted to make sure that I had a you know, diverse group of narrators. And um, I, th I think that I, that, you know, there were so many other perspectives too that could have been brought in. I don't have them as my narrator, but I also brought in the point of view of the women who were against suffrage. Um, I, I, I find this, I, I, I read about them and I understand what they say they were coming from. I absolutely 100% disagree, disagree with them. Um, but, you know, I wanted to bring in that, that, uh, that concept too, that not all women were in favor of women getting the right to vote. They were very happy with the status quo because it was working well for them. You know, these were usually white, wealthy, privileged women and having the men in their lives just look out for their needs. They had done very well by that and they didn't want anything to interfere with that. So there were actual groups, just as there were suffrage groups, there were anti-suffrage groups as well. And I thought it would you know, I thought uh, it was very important to to mention that as well. It was not a uniform. All women were 100% behind this movement. And uh, as much as we might wish that were so, it was not. Yeah. And I wanted to explain why not, too. And I think Ida B. Wells makes an obvious second choice, too, and her influence. Um, but the third was sort of a surprise to me. And I don't know how, you know, you narrowed it down from all of the other characters to settle on Maud Malone. Well, she was very active in workers' rights movements. Mm -hmm. She was she was the one who was interrupting these politicians at their campaign speeches, regardless of their political party. She wasn't just picking on Wilson. She went to Teddy Roosevelt too. He had left the Republican Party because he didn't get the nomination and was started his own progressive party. And she went to his speeches too and asked him the same question. Now to his credit, he answered it um, as opposed to Wilson who was like, no, it's not for me. It's a state issue. It's not a national issue. Um, but, and another thing- about mask man. I can't, I can't answer mask mandates. Yes. <laughs> it's somebody else. It Sorry. just, you know what? It's a neighborhood question. Whatever's going on in your block. No. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, and, and I think Maude was right to say, this is a national issue. It affects women everywhere. You know, don't, don't, and he's just, oh no, no. You know, I'm just here to represent the national party. Come on, at least answer the question. None of the other candidates, you know, some of them were very flustered and couldn't give her an answer at all because who is this woman standing up? But I love the fact that she had this wonderful sense of humor and she just wanted to, she just wanted an answer to a question. She wasn't afraid to challenge these men. When she would speak on the streets to, at, at her own impromptu uh, campaign or uh, suffrage rallies, she would engage the audience by using humor and teasing them a little bit and joking, joking with them. So she was really dispelling the, the myth that was in the press, it was popularized in the press at the time that these were all a bunch of militant, unsmiling, dried up old, old biddies who couldn't, you know, she was out there cracking jokes and teasing people who disagreed with them and, and heckling the hecklers right back. And I love that about her. And another thing about Maud too, is she led the first suffrage march in the United States and it took place in New York. So I thought, wow, not only did the January 2017 
uh, march on Washington have a historical precedent. So too did Alice Paul's march. There were other marches in the US before her, you know, her the one that she wanted to be this magnificent, splendid display. And I thought, well, you know, she's she's got this great sense of humor. She represents the working class. She led the first march in the US. And also, I loved the idea that she was a librarian. I like, I have a soft spot in my heart for librarians and independent booksellers. And I just, you know, I thought this is fantastic. So the fact that she was a militant suffragist librarian was also very important to me. My first job in high school, I mean, I did babysitting, you know, all that kind of stuff growing up. My first real job was as a page at the Thousand Oaks City Library when I was in high school. So I've loved, I mean, I've loved libraries all my life, but you know, the opportunity to write about a librarian is one I rarely pass up when it comes my way. And I have, this is not my first librarian that I've written about. <laughs> and it, apparently it won't be your last. It one. shall <laughs> not be my last. <laughs> one of the, yes, I love also the way that um, Maude, you know, in terms of class, not just, not that she's not, almost not subject to some of the, um, uh, sort of restrictions that Alice might have in terms of propriety, but also that she has to actually, when she's dealing with some of these wealthy people, she has to think about supporting herself and having a job. Yes, and that's, that's very important too, because uh, a much of the suffrage movement was kind of the domain of women of privilege, because they, they didn't have to worry about getting up early to go to work the next day. Many of them did, but in, in large part, these were women who had family money, indulgent husbands, or they were, in the case of like Ava Belmont, they were extremely wealthy widows who could spend their money however they saw fit and apparently never run out. Um, but I wanted to show that, you know, for some, for some people who desperately needed the vote, it was, ex it was very challenging to participate in the suffrage movement because, you know, either they were responsible for caring for children or they had, they had to work for a living and they couldn't just take time off to march. And Maude is in the position where, you know, she was the first generation Irish immigrant and um, she, you know, she, she had to work to support herself. She was unmarried. Um, she needed to, you know, keep her jobs. That meant not offending her employer. It meant showing up for work on time. So showing how she managed to balance her activism while still keeping food on her table, I thought was important. And in the story, we see that she, she does it, well, sometimes she can't participate in events that she would very much like to, but also she gets help from friends and her siblings come to help her out every once in a while when she needs it. I think that, and two, with all the characters, education played so strongly in their background and the understanding that education and the right to vote would change the world, would change our circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you want to, I mean, and just that, um, there were so many times where I dog-eared little pages it, because you have these um, quotes that are just parts in there where you're bringing the history into such a contemporary understanding of what we're dealing with right now with equity and race and equal rights, well, equity. And so I just thought when you were writing this at the time that you were, having the two voices coming together must have been just this aha moment. Yes, and especially when I was engaging with the material as a reader yeah. and as a researcher, you know, I the I'm, I'm glad that you, you feel that the book is very timely and it deals with issues that we are, we are grappling with today, but that is not a contemporary perspective that I'm imposing on the past. Right. I discovered it in the reading. And um, I list a lot of my sources in the acknowledgements page and, um, or in the author's note. Well, it's, it's in the back matter, you'll, you'll see it, you won't miss it. Um, and I encourage readers who are fascinated by these characters and want to learn more to delve into some of these books in more detail, especially Ida B. Wells Barnett's writings. 
because um, in her memoir and in the writings that she did in her civil rights advocacy, uh, she just says things that are so true and she puts them forward with such boldness and strength and clarity that she could be speaking to us today in 2021. And um, for her, it, she's a perfect example of what you said about how education was so important to making your way in the world. And um, she was born in 1862. So she was born into enslavement, but emancipation followed a few years later and her parents, so she doesn't, but, but still, even though she wasn't, you know, she doesn't have a long history in, as an enslaved person, her, it was certainly a part of her family memory because her parents were both enslaved and their parents and her aunts and uncles. So one of the things that her own parents realized as soon as freedom came was that education was absolutely going to be the key for their children. She had numerous siblings to make their way in the world and to, and to become self-supporting and prosperous. And so when some Northerners came down and started establishing schools for freedmen, um, and some of these turned into the historic black colleges and universities that are still thriving today, um, her parents were absolutely insistent that Ida and her siblings get an education. Ida's mother did too. She was able to in, attend one of these colleges because although she was very devout and she had the Bible memorized, she also wanted to be able to read it. So she specifically went to learn how to read so that she could read her Bible, which is something that was very deeply important to her in her religious faith. So Ida was very, very bright. I would say brilliant. And she got her education and um, she was continuing to study. And, you know, with all of this, with, with you know, a future wide open to her. And then there was a yellow fever um, epidemic um, in the US, specifically in the Southern US. And she lost both of her parents and two of her siblings. And even though she was still a teenager at the time, rather than have her family split up, she, which she knew her, would devastate her parents if, if they, you know, be, um, you know, disloyal to their memory, she halted her own education and became a teacher so that she could support her siblings and keep the family together. And so she went from teaching to journalism and through both of these tasks through both of these professions, she became such a strong advocate for the black community through her lecturing, through her writing, and it often put her in harm's way. There were death threats, there were attempts on her life. And um, the fact that she persisted and she was, you know, and she, she said in her memoir, you know, she carried a gun around and if they were gonna take her down, well, she'd take a couple of them with her, um, which it was a very strong statement, but I think you know, we have to try to understand where she was coming from in, in making those statements. So Ida too was such an amazing, remarkable figure. My fictional character, I, is, I, I did my best, but it, it's a tribute to the real woman I strongly encourage readers to really get to know the historical figure of Ida B. Wells Barnett, not just the fictional character as I have presented her in my novel. Um, last year, 2020, she was posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize. And I think really she is, she is someone who deserves to be one of uh, the most revered civil rights figures in the United States. And I, I hope that I've done her justice in my fiction, and I really hope that readers will go on to learn more about her. Yeah, you really drew in so much um, desire to learn more about all of the characters, even the minor characters. I was just Googling and delving into things and thought, well, I'm gonna put all my other reading aside, but <laughs> Ida B. Wells was one that just blew me away. And you, you underlined the history so well as to better understand today. Oh, good, good. One of the things you had said to us uh, earlier is that some the family legacy can sort of determine how well somebody's known. And the, one of the issues for why a lot of people don't 
one of the reasons why we, and now of course we're celebrating um, black um, leaders and um, heroes that we might not have in the past, but also her family paid a role in that and possibly also a role in why we don't know that much about Maude. Would you talk a little about how that works? Sure. Uh Ida B. Wells' family has, um, in my research, and I wasn't able to travel when I was writing this book because of the pandemic, but um, through internet searches, I've seen that they are doing a wonderful, they're putting forward a wonderful effort to preserve Ida B. Wells' Barnett's legacy, especially in the Chicago area where a home has been preserved. And it, it's, they have done a, so much to, you know, make sure that she does, is not forgotten the way Maude is. Now I would say her impact on American history is more profound and lasting than Maude Malone's was, but um, you know, they are continuing to, to make sure that she is known and is read and is studied. And I think the Pulitzer Award will certainly do more to encourage maybe in the schools and for her to be more studied than she currently is. She was, she was one of the founders of the NAACP. I mean, I could, I mean, her accomplishments are just, uh, you know, there, I couldn't even list them all here for you today, or, you know, we'd, we'd be talking for quite, quite a few hours. Um, Alice Paul never married and did not have any descendants, but she was so active in Women, the women's rights movement, even after the amendment was passed and women were given, granted the right to vote, she continued to work for women's rights for the ERA amendment. She was active in that movement well into her, her last years, well into the 1970s. So she remained so much a presence in the women's rights movement that even though she did not have children who were preserving her legacy. In fact, one heir, a nephew, um, <laughs> did a lot to actually swindle her out of her money. So we're not going to spend too much time talking about him. Um, <laughs> um, but Maude Malone, she really, although she was notorious in her time, she was frequently written about in the newspaper. She was quite well known is because of her heckling activities. She kind of, after the, after the suffrage amendment was passed, she continued to work. She was continued to work as a librarian, but there's very little about her in the press. Um, and uh, I love to research newspaper articles from the era in order to see what my characters were up to. But there's very little mention of her in contemporary scholarship about the woman's suffrage movement and, you know, so just discovering her through these newspaper articles about her heckling was really my way into um, bringing her back out and, and letting readers know more about her. But you were right what you said earlier, there's so many women involved that really I could have, I could have, you know, Ava Belmont could have been, uh, Harriet Stanton could have been one. I mean, there's so many other women Dora Lewis, she was very remarkable as well. She has a small role in the book, but uh, you know the novel ends in 1913. The suffrage amendment didn't come; it wasn't enacted, and you know, till several years later. And in that time, uh, American suffragists faced incredible hardship. Um, they uh, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, before they returned to the US and started revitalizing the National Amendment campaign in the US, they were in Great Britain working on the front lines of the British suffrage movement with the Pankhurst. And there were, in there, they were imprisoned, they went on hunger strikes, they were force fed, and it was so traumatic and harmful to their health that eventually, that is why Alice returned to the US because she was just so debilitated from the hunger strikes and the forced feedings and the condition in prison that she eventually gave into her mother's pleas to come home and recover her health. And shortly thereafter, she became involved and re-involved again in the American suffrage movement. But I would say that, you know, after this novel ends, soon thereafter, 
the women on the you know suffrage front lines in the U.S. They went through some terrible, terrible times that easily equaled the worst of what Alice Paul and Lucy Burns suffered and endured in the UK. So, um, you know, there was Dora Lewis was one of the women who endure, endured the Night of Terror, which is one um, something that happens outside the scope of the novel when um, a group of suffragists who were protesting outside the gates of the White House were arrested and were taken to a just a truly horrific prison and endured just absolutely appalling, appalling treatment. And so, you know, Dora Lewis would have been someone else who would have been great to focus on. But as I mentioned earlier, the subject is so broad in scope, covering so many years with so many key figures that I really needed to narrow it down and focus on one thing. And I think that's true. Also an important message from the movement itself is that it was not, any one person's accomplishment. It wasn't even one leader with thousands of followers. It was, was thousands, countless thousands of people working sometimes together, sometimes separated by distance or separated by era, but all of them played a part in the eventual passing of the amendment and they all deserve a share of credit for that eventual victory. One of the characters too that was secondary and it built into the family was um, Rosalie Gardner um, Jones. And do yes. you want to talk about her? Because that's how you were able to even bring some of the aunties in. Yes. Well, whereas we have Maude Malone, who was from you know the working class, and you know, and um, then we uh, and then we have Alice Paul, who was a Quaker and very studious, very academic. Uh, Rosalie Gardner Jones was a debutante. She was one of these women from wealth and privilege. Her parents both inherited wealth from their families and her father earned another fortune himself. So she was someone who stood to have a very nice life if she went along with the status quo. But Rosalie Gardner Jones, that was just not how she was made up. So she threw herself into the suffrage movement. And she, her, her idea was something that she really used as her way to get the message across and to raise awareness was that she scheduled the, or she set up these long distance marches from one city to another or from a particular destination to a state capital, engaging with the press every step of the way to really just try to bring awareness to the, to the movement and to why women wanted the vote and why women needed the vote and what the advantages would be to society as a whole if women did have the right to choose the people who were representing them in government. But her, Rosalie's mother was actually a literal card carrying member of one of the most prominent anti-suffrage organizations in the US. So they, you know, the, the, they loved one and they loved each other. And then there was a sister who was also one of the antis. And uh, she would try so hard to discourage her daughter from participating in these, in these marches and in these suffrage lectures and all of that. She even once on a long distance march from Albany to Washington DC, which was right at before the suffrage pr procession um, that Alice Paul arranged, she even tried to get a private detective and a police officer to kidnap Rosalie and pull her away from this march just to, just that it was the only thing she could think of to get her daughter to stop all of this rabble rousing and all of that. Now the, the plot failed, but um, so this is what Rosalie had going on even within her own family. So um, it, it's fascinating to think of the dynamic that this wealthy debutante who turns her back on all of her wealth and privilege to advocate for the right to vote and her mother just trying every trick she can think of to get her daughter back home and out of the papers. So she's a really a vibrant woman too. And I was really thrilled to discover her and to include her in the book. Um. 
your book has everything because it's like, <laughs> well, because I think of it like, you know, in terms of the anti suffragist movement, I felt like one of the most comic parts of the book was the group that puts like the anti suffrage headquarters like down the block from the suffrage headquarters. To, I don't know. I, yeah, it was, and that, you know, again, you know, if I had made this up and I am allowed to make stuff up when I write novels and I no. have in fact made up stuff in this particular novel, you know, it is fiction, it is a novel. Um, I did not invent the fact that, you know, we had uh, Alice Paul sets up headquarters on this block of Washington DC and then just down the block, the anti-suffragists set up their own headquarters. I mean, they could almost shout to one another from their front stoops. It's like, you know, you know, really, you had to put your thing, you had to put your shop just down the block, you know. Um, and then of course they moved out, you know, a couple of days after the march. But right. yeah, that I thought that's just, you know, oh, that could only happen in real life. <laughs> oh, and oh my God, and the thrills, I mean, that march is so tense with 5,000 people on the procession and what, 250,000 people in the Estimated, and, yeah. and not Estimated. particularly friendly. No, they were not. Most people all of, of that quarter, estimated quarter of a million people, mostly men who had, who were lining the streets for, you know, on March 3rd, they were there not to support the suffragists, but they were there for the inauguration the next day. And they were not necessarily what you would call strong suffrage supporters. Um, and they were, you know, they were a big crowd, it was a party atmosphere. A lot of them had been drinking heavily. And although Alice and Lucy and some of the other women involved had been urging everyone from the local police chief who was ultimately in charge of what was going on to the secretary of war who had connections to various, you know, um, military outposts nearby the city to you know, make sure that you have adequate security because it's not like this was the first march on Pennsylvania Avenue. It wasn't, it was just as it turned out to be the largest one to date. But you know, there were certain rules before a march, a certain amount of time before a march, the street, you know, the, the police are supposed to clear Pennsylvania Avenue. And of course there was even a struggle for, to convince them to give the Congressional Committee a permit to use Pennsylvania Avenue. The police commissioner, uh, Sylvester, just kept trying to say, well, don't you wanna go on this other street instead? And Alice Paul said, no, we want to march where the men march. She understood the symbolic significance of Pennsylvania Avenue and what it represented. And um, she, was just, she was going to have that route. So they had plenty of time to prepare an adequate security presence, not just a few stanchions and wires and then you know a few police here and there. And Alice had been pushing this and pushing this and they assured her it was well under control. And you know, part of it was, you know, they uh, it's it seems that the police thought, well, if they think they're not safe, they'll cancel or the women just won't show up. But that serious, that was a serious underestimation of Alice Paul and all of the marchers' determination to be there and to be present. So, you know, if they deliberately were negligent because they hoped that then the women would just go away, well, that did not work out well for anyone involved, police or, and marchers alike. So many contemporary parallels. Lisa, yeah. would you want to ask a question? Then I'll do some audience ones. Okay. Well, I was, when you were doing the research, were there a couple of incidences that you discovered that really just floored you, that just surprised you? Oh, so many things from Alice, from Ida B. Wells' life. Um, you know, just little, the, the just, some of the, the, just the constant encounters of racism and threats against her life that she just ran into day, you know, day after day, year after year, and how she never gave up. I mean, she was an, she was a, a journalist, I mentioned earlier, but she's also an editor of a newspaper. And uh, one time when she was out traveling around to get some research for an article in her absence, 
I don't recall now whether they knew she was gone or if they were hoping she was there, um, but she happened to be absent at the time off on a, you know, on a, on a research trip to gather information for a new piece she was writing. Um, her writings, you know, she didn't mince words. She didn't put anything in use, euphemism. She called people out on their racism and that made racists angry. And so there was a, an occasion where an angry mob just burst into their offices and beat up the people who were there, um, destroyed the printing presses, just absolutely trashed the offices and told her that, and well, got word to her that uh, if she came back, they were going to kill her. If she returned to you know, the state of her birth, they were going to kill her. And, you know, at first she was willing to, she was going to come back. She said, you know what, I'm, this is my home. I'm going to, they're not going to scare me away. I'm going to come home. But then it wasn't her friend. It wasn't her enemy's statements that made her change her mind. It was the, the, the response of her supporters. They told her, yes, come back. We are going to protect you. We will be here. If anyone tries to kill you, they'll have to get through us. And that's where she had to say that that's where she had to stay away because she knew if she returned, you know, her own life, you know, that's up to her, but she didn't want other people who would try to defend her to die. She didn't want her friends and, and loyal readers and loyal supporters. She didn't want any bloodshed. So that she stayed in the North for many years after that. She started in New York and then she ended up in Chicago. And so the fact that the threats against her life were so, so real and so backed up with so much hate and so much, you know, just so much ability to act on that hate despite the law, um, th that just, that really just really hit home for me. And again, it even, you know, there's so many echoes of contemporary events that it, it's really hard to miss some of the parallels. Um, but she was never quiet. She did not, you know, she had to change where she lived and, you know, it, it saddened her even as it just, you know, made her redouble her determination to keep on writing and to keep on speaking. Yeah, the scene that she's riding to Washington on the train is brilliant. And we won't have to go into it, but that is definitely one where you capture the parallels. Thank you. And I think, and one, sorry, one, one of the things that, that, you know, it's just, she is so aware of, and you know, and, you know, maybe we're more, um, you know, we, there have been a, a, a many books, fiction, nonfiction, press, everything that talks about Southern racism. But then there's also, um, Ida dealt with, northern racism and also northern indifference sometimes her well-meaning chicago friends were just so oblivious to the challenges that she faced as a black woman you know not just you know it, you know well you're not in the south so things must be must be great well no that's not actually true and i you know i think that that is something that might make some readers uncomfortable to hear about you know, that, um, you know, there was certainly was and is racism in the North as well as the South. And, and Ida, you know, her friends loved her and cared about, with, about her, but they just didn't always get it. And, um, you know, there was, sometimes she had to use her own experiences. And, and, you know, she was not shy about letting people know when they missed it, when, even if that person was, you know, a very revered, suffrage matriarch like Susan B. Anthony. Um, I, I'll, I'll let readers read about it in, in the novel, but there's one occasion where Susan B. Anthony had the opportunity to do something very profound for black women who wanted to form a suffrage group. And she chose to prioritize a relationship with white Southern women. And Alice, I'm sorry, Ida called her on it. And, um, you know, you'd think that, you know, it would be difficult because Susan B. Anthony was very revered um, by suffragists of all kinds for everything that she contributed to the movement. But Ida was willing to challenge her 
on uh, when she let down women of color. And um, to her credit, Susan B. Anthony, according to the historical record, accepted that criticism and tried to do better moving forward. The, the relationship with um, Wells and Jane Addams was also really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Jane Addams was, um, she's another secondary figure um, only in the novel. She's certainly not a secondary figure in, you know, uh, uh, civil rights movement and um, so many social justice causes. Um, but, you know, it's, it, was, it was wonderful that she showed up because in Chicago, you know, Jane Addams founded Hull House and was so involved with looking out for disenfranchised people, the poor, any, all sorts of marginalized populations. And I thought it was just so serendipitous that they knew each other and their paths crossed so often so that I could bring Jane Addams into the novel as well. Do you want, we always, um, we have a few questions, but a lot of them are about research. And I think we know that you weren't able to do in-person research for this book. No, well, I couldn't do travel. Um, yeah. You know, that would have been irresponsible. And I try to be, I try to be a responsible citizen. And uh, of course, looking out for my health and my family's health as well. So no, travel was not possible for this book. Um, however, you know, I went to graduate school in Chicago. I, I visited there frequently, both when I was an undergraduate and all the way up until, you know, now uh, Chicago is a very nice distance from Wisconsin where Madison, we can travel down and, and visit. So Chicago is fairly familiar to me. Washington DC, I have visited numerous times and I've set other books there. And then New York City, I have not visited quite as much, um, you know, but again, I've researched and written about it too. So I was lucky that, uh, you know, travel wasn't as absolutely essential to this book. It probably, it, well, um, I'm sure there are things that maybe would have been done differently if I had been able to travel to do research, but it just was not something that I could do in 2020. And it's looking like probably not in 2021 either, but no. Please. Would you like to talk about um, any, give us any book recommendations? Oh, wow. Well, actually, um, I've read a wonderful book by um, Roxanne Valetzos, um, When the Summer Was Ours, for those of you who love historical fiction as much as I do. And um, if you like World War II fiction, this is one that covers an entire different region, an entirely different group of characters that um, I really enjoyed reading. And, uh, you know, it focuses on Hungary and it's by a very, very talented author. And um, so that, that's a book that I'm, I'm, I'm strongly recommending. It's really just fresh out, freshly out. I think it's just very recently published. And in fact, I'm gonna be hosting uh, a talk with her at, with um, Boswell Book Company uh, coming up pretty soon. So August 26th. And I don't even think the book's out yet. So oh, it's not even um, out yet. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited about that book. Um, Jane, who's worked with me for years and uh, she's retired now, but she saw that she's like, that's a really interesting take on World yeah. War II because I don't know much about what was going on there. So, you know, and, and I, oh. I, I gotta tell you what originally drew me to it was that some of my ancestors on my father's side were from Hungary but they weren't Hungarian. Some of your readers might know about this, but I thought, oh, maybe I'll be able to read about the village where, you know, great grandpa Neidenbach came from. They were Danya Schwaben, um, they lived in the Banat. So that I admit is what originally, you know, if you know it, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, so they were ethnic Germans who around the time, you know, the United States was becoming the United States were actually granted land in Hungary because it was considered the frontier back then. And so I admit, I picked this book up when, when it was suggested to me, when it was recommended to me thinking, maybe I'll be able to read something that ties into my own family history. It turned out it didn't do that at all, but <laughs> I forgot about that, you know, halfway through the first chapter because I was hooked, but so that's what took me to the book, but it was the writing itself and the unique setting and the vivid descriptions that really kept me in there. So, um, you know, it's, it's, if you think you've, you know, if you're, if you think you've read all that World War II fiction you need, you haven't, you need this one too. <laughs> wow.
And then anything I write about World yeah. War II. In the well, future, someone did ask, what, <laughs> are you willing to say anything about what you're working on? Oh, willing and eager. I will say. Um, yes, I do have another book coming out with William Morrow again um, next year. I believe it will be July of 2022. And this is another book in the similar time frame of the Women's March, but it's maybe a few years later. Um, well, it's definitely a few years later. Um, it's called Switchboard Soldiers. And it is the story of uh, the American and French immigrant um, telephone operators who served with the United States Army Signal Corps in France during World War I. Because I think we know maybe from our, the movies and books we've read about World War II, how important radios were in communicating from the front to headquarters and everywhere else. Well, the radio had been invented then, but it was not anywhere near the technology where you know, that you might know from World War II. It was actually telephones that were still so very important for communication. And maybe you've seen these kind of things in old pictures or old newsreels about the old school, you know, telephone exchanges where you had the women seated at these tall stools and they plug the plug in here and then they have to link it over here and then they're stretching around each other and, and all of that. And they're asking number please and doing all that. Well, you know, those, those phones were not gonna operate themselves. And when General Pershing went over to France, he realized that the phone system was just not good enough to, if he wanted to win this war. And he wanted the absolute best telephone operators that could be found. And those were American women, but they didn't have to, it wasn't enough to just be really good as a telephone operator, he had to be bilingual English and French. So that narrowed down the field of candidates even more. So, you know, this, this recruitment went out and this drive and telephone exchanges and companies across the US and um, to get these women together and they had to drill and train and firearms training and marching and everything else. And they were absolutely essential to victory. And all of this serving their country while they could not vote for all of those men who sent soldiers to war and made those decisions. So um, they, I was really impressed when I learned about these women and all of their accomplishments. And I, I knew that my readers would too. So I wrote, I wrote this novel all about them. So Switchboard Soldiers will be out. It'll be available from Books and Company and Basel <laughs> Book Company. So. Lisa, last question for you. Oh, well. Um... No, I don't know that I had a wrap up question other than I was just listening. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't have one <laughs> without going into another 20 minutes, which I'm sure we would all like to I do. I know, <laughs> see, I write novels. If I wrote short stories, you could count on me for brief answers, but. No. <laughs> oh, you should talk to some people. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that can be pretty brief some. I bet there's a story. Oh yeah, just, yeah, you don't ask yes or no nah, question. Yeah, we nah. would have had this wrapped up in 15 minutes. If it was yeah. <laughs> oh, this was the perfect length. Um, we're thrilled to talk to you. And, oh, I'm um, always so happy to talk to both of you. And to everyone watching, these are two of my absolute be very favorite bookstores. They have supported my work since my first book came out in 1999, um, back when it was Harry Schwartz. Oh yeah. Daniel's, in Daniel's case. <laughs> but um, they have supported me all of these decades. Oh my gosh, it's decades now. So <laughs> when you choose where to buy your books, your own neighborhood independent bookstore is a wonderful choice. But also, um, if you could support these two bookstores, I would consider it a personal favor because of all the all the support that they've shown me through the years. And keep in mind, it's independent bookstores and libraries. Let's give them a, we have to bring them into this too. It's independent bookstores and libraries that set up events like this so that, you know, in times of pandemic, we can meet virtually. And on other occasions, they bring us to your towns so that we can meet in person and talk about books and history and all these things that we care so much about. So. Um, independent bookstores have supported me. I support them when I can, and I strongly encourage you to do so, do so too, so that I can keep writing books 
and then we can keep having conversations about history oh. and all that great stuff that we love so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait for the next book and um, continued success. And thank thanks you. and thanks to everyone who came. We wouldn't have bookstore uh, our bookstores without you. Yes. Thank you and thank you, Jennifer. It's been a delight. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank you yes, so much for having you. me. And thanks, thanks to everyone Daniel. for attending. Thank Yay. you, Daniel. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everybody out there for attending. I really do appreciate it.